us uh, for a week or two. Um, I always like to go back to our foundation when we get started because, you know, repetition is a good thing. When you're talking about the fundamental principles of freedom, when you're talking about defending the Constitution, that repetition of what those things actually mean is really important. So what we've been talking about for the last several months is purpose of government, which is secure the rights of the people, the purpose of the Constitution, which is to keep government small and as government is limited and honors their role, freedom is maximized. And so we talk a lot about that. And then as we go about understanding those two principles, it's understanding as well how these ideas operate in the real world. So there's going to be some frustration along the way. I don't care if you've been with us for you know the four or five months that we've been getting together or you're brand new. There's always frustration because we're we're going to talk about um, some ideas. And tonight we're going to have a lot of fun talking about um, a particular issue. And there'll likely be some disagreement along the way, right? We, we, we might have different ideas on how we go about best um, protecting freedom and how we go about best ensuring that government stays in its lane. But here's what I know, that even though there might be some disagreement, I know that we all agree on the foundations. But we all believe in this idea that we should be left alone. And we all believe in this idea that government should follow the rules. And we all believe in this idea that we should be able to keep what we earn, that we should be able to utilize our productive capacity, and that we should be able to keep what we earn as we go about utilizing that productive capacity. And of course, we all believe in the idea of personal responsibility. That is the essence of freedom, what we just outlined there. So I know we all agree on that. And the founding fathers agreed on those ideas, right? The founding fathers were, wait a second, we, we have inherent freedom and that inherent freedom exists by virtue of our humanity where you know, we were endowed by our creator with those certain things. And it's the job of government, if you're going to have government at all, at all to protect those ideas, to protect the liberties of the people. Now, even though the founders agreed on that foundation, did they disagree on execution? Without question. You know, tonight we're not going to talk about it, but in the past we've debated it, term limits. Listen, I if I open this up for debate, I bet, I, I, I'm guessing I've been around this, this game long enough to know that most individuals that are kind of libertarian-leaning, liberty-loving, conservative, kind of the momentum is towards term limits. But I know there's some on here that don't agree with it. I don't agree with them. Now, if I disagree with you on term limits, is that here's what's going on within the conservative movement, within those that love liberty. We disagree with like, oh man, that Krauser guy, man, I don't know about him. He doesn't, he doesn't buy into term limits. Isn't it interesting how we do that? I'm just so thankful the founders didn't do that, right? Because the convention wouldn't have lasted very long. Oh, that Benjamin Franklin guy. Are you kidding me? I'm out of here. Alexander Hamilton, the big government guy, he's all about a central bank. I'm out of here. Right. I wish we modeled the behavior Damn. of the founders much more consistently, where we could recognize that we do agree on a foundation. But man, can we have genuine disagreements on what we think will get us to where we need to go? Can we have genuine disagreements on how we get to the ideal? And when I talk about the ideal, what I mean is the Declaration of Independence. Remember, the Declaration of Independence, when it was written, it was a declaration of war but it was also a summary of the ideal. It was a summary of the ideal of the human condition, which is all men have freedom. All men and women are free. We have freedoms that are inherent. Now, at the time that they wrote that, was that a fact? No, right? There are people being enslaved. There are people being enslaved today, right? So it's not, is that where the founders were at at the time? It was, here's where we need to go. Right. We want to embrace this idea of freedom. How do we best get there? Let's put a constitution in place. Right. The declaration is the why. The constitution is the how. So this is a constant struggle towards the ideal. And this constitution was a bit of a compromise. We, we understand that there was a lot of compromise. Listen, the, even though Thomas Jefferson wasn't at the convention, Madison was very much a mouthpiece for him. I think we all agree that the small government guys felt like they conceded on some things that they wish they wouldn't have had to concede on. And the bigger government guys, right? Like an Alexander Hamilton or a John Ham Adams, they were bigger government guys by those standards. 
they probably conceded on some things they weren't happy about. But again, there was agreement on a foundation. There was disagreement on how we get there. So tonight, we're going to talk about some things. Uh, we're going to talk about a principle found in the Constitution. And we're going to talk about how we should go about interpreting this idea. Now, when you start thinking about the right to be left alone, let me open this up. When, you, when we mention the right to be left alone, what comes to mind? What comes to mind when you think about that? And by the way, if you want to talk, no reason to raise your digital hand or your physical hand, just unmute and chime in. Yeah, this please, is, please, I please, wish please. we were all in the same room, but we're not. So we'll try and make it as close to that as possible. Brandon. Hey, hey yeah, hey, Shane. Uh, I would say the right to be left alone is basically if I'm not pissing anybody off, then nobody bothers me for anything. But, but Brandon, I know you well enough that even if you were ticking some people off, you should still leave me alone. <laughs> That's true, actually. You're right. I guess. But, but Brandon, I, I know what you're getting at. Yeah. You're, you're getting at the higher principle. And that is, listen, I should have the right to be left alone so long as I'm not violating the life, liberty, or property of another human being. That's the idea, right? When we talk about freedom, that's what we're talking about. You and I should have the ability to live our lives as we see fit. And so long as I don't violate the life, liberty, or property of my neighbor or anybody else for that matter, I, I should be left alone. I should be left alone. Now, are we living in that kind of society today? No. No, we have a lot of people marching around telling other people what to do. And uh, that's not a good thing. Don Dickinson, what, were you, what, what are your thoughts? Oh, I'm ready to stir the pot. Uh, how about the right to not have your home invaded? Rated. <laughs> yes. Yeah, now, let me, Don, Don, let me ask you, what, is there an amendment or a provision in the Constitution that outlines the rules for the government and how they interact with your house and how they might interact with you? Um, you I, I, you uh, 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 at least four come to mind, actually the fourth, but hey, I'm no constitutional scholar, but I've read a couple of things. Yep. Well, you nailed it. You nailed it, brother. The Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, um, it, again, remember that the Constitution is a rule book. It's the law. It's the supreme law of the land. We know that because Article 6 of the Constitution makes that declaration. The Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. So when you look at the Constitution, it is not a dot. This is really important. And I'm reiterating this for, uh, for everybody, whether you're brand new or otherwise. The, the Constitution is not a declaration of rights for the purposes of telling us what our rights are and reminding us of those things. If there is any sort of declaration, and there is, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, free exercise of religion, those things are not listed there to remind me and you as to what our liberties are. They're there to remind government that as they go about doing the things that we permitted them to do, don't you dare touch those things. Don't you dare touch the freedom of speech or the freedom of the press or the free exercise of religion or the right to keep and bear arms. Don't you dare touch those things. So this is a rule book. And by and large, it's a rule book that's telling government specifically the things that they, if they're going to do you things that are prohibition saying, listen, as you go about doing the things that we're allowing you to do, do that we've delegated to you or we vested in you, hey, just keep your hands off of this stuff over here, would you? That's the idea. So the Fourth Amendment, what does the Fourth Amendment speak to? And then I'm going to ask, uh, we're going to move into a hypothetical here. Actually, it's, a, it's an actual case, but uh, for our purposes, it'll be a hypothetical on how we might deal with it. What is the Fourth Amendment designed to do? The right of the people. Oh, sorry, Kelvin, go ahead. Oh, right for to people privacy. to be secure exactly. in their, yeah, to be secure in their possessions and their property. Yeah, Good. correct. Good, excellent. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Who else was chiming in? Is that you, Jim? No, I was just going to say unreasonable search and seizure. Good, good, good. So, guys, what I'd like you to do, if you've got your constitutions handy, I would like you to pull that up. In fact, let me pull it up on my screen as well, <clears throat> uh, because I want to ask you a few questions. The Fourth Amendment. Okay, here we go. Let me pull this up. And that way everybody can see it. If you don't have your constitution handy, 
That is no problem. We'll pull it up right here on the screen. All right, here we go. Can you all see that? Give me a, th okay, good. So this is the fourth amendment, okay? Now, there are two provisions here. The first provision is what we call the reasonableness clause. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Now, what the heck is unreasonable, right? There you have a, a kind of a vague term that is put into the Fourth Amendment. And what have the legislatures, along with the courts, attempted to do for the last 200 and some odd years? Defining what is reasonable versus unreasonable. And we're going to get to that here in just a moment. The second clause is what we call the warrants clause. By the way, if you've got the Constitution, I know many of you have my book. You can get it on eBay or Amazon, Your Nation to Save. Uh, this is a line-by-line -line explanation of the Constitution. On the left-hand side is the actual text of the Constitution. On the right-hand side is my interpretation. So I'm offering some of my insights in terms of what was the original intent, what does this actually mean. And so the second clause is the warrants clause. So if you've got your Constitution and that first one, that first clause put the reasonableness, reasonableness clause. The second clause that we're getting ready to read that's separated by that comma is the warrants clause. And no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Okay? Now, here's what I want you to know. Um, not all searches require a warrant. Now, this is an easy concept. It's an easy concept. I know sometimes we... We, we want to, no, wait a second. I want to have government. I want to put a high bar there and say that every search that they ever do has to be accompanied by a warrant. Well, that was not the intent of the founders and that is not the intent of the Fourth Amendment. And let me just give you one example. A police officer approaches you on the street and has a consensual conversation with you and says, hey, can I search your person? And you say yes. Or they pull you over for a traffic violation and they ask you, do you mind if I search? And you say, yeah, you can consent to a search. If you consent to a search and the law enforcement officer, in fact, does search, he doesn't have to get a warrant. There are a number of exceptions to the warrant requirement. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But if you're looking inside my book and you go to page 97, there are eight exceptions, generally speaking, to the warrant requirement. Right. So what we're talking about here on that warrants clause is when a warrant is required. Here's what must be what must be outlined. Now, think about Mar-a-Lago with the Donald Trump situation. And by the way, I, for those of you that are relatively new, I'm an equal opportunity hater. I don't play the R&D game. I just I'm not interested. Freedom, my allegiance is to freedom. It's to no human being. It's to no individual. I just want government to follow the rules. And I want them to leave people alone in the process. OK, and if you're going to intrude on somebody's home or on their person, just follow the rules. So. People have been asking me about what I think about this uh, search and seizure that was done out at uh, Trump's property. And I've been saying the same thing. I want to see the warrant. I, I'm, I'm, I'm unwilling to jump to any conclusions. That I want to see the warrant. I've, in my career as a prosecutor, I read hundreds of warrants. I want to see the warrant and what they were ultimately looking for. We, we're speculating that there was um, security, uh, some high level information that was taken. That's what we're assuming. I want to see the warrant. What does that warrant have to include? Well, it tells us right here, there's got to be probable cause and it's got to be supported by oath or, oath or affirmation. What does that mean? It means after law enforcement puts together a warrant, they have to appear in front of a judge or a magistrate, basically hold their arm to the square and say, I promise that the information contained herein is true and accurate to the best of my knowledge. Now, can a judge also look at, yes, they're looking at it as well. So you have the executive branch, namely law enforcement, they're putting together this warrant, and then they're appearing in front of the judicial branch. And that's the oath or affirmation. And within that warrant, they have to, they have to specifically describe, where are we searching? In other words, they're listing the home, they're listing the address in the home, and these, these, uh, these warrants are quite interesting because they will go into specifics as to what the house looks like. They won't just put the address. No, the house is a white home with red trim. From the front, there's a, a door. 
and that door is covered by you know a security door and you know they'll they'll describe some things that are very specific and then what things are we looking for so understand this is why i want to see the warrant general searches are unconstitutional general in other words i can't just put together a warrant and say i want to search this house and we'll see if we find any bad stuff when we get in there that is illegal it's patently illegal so and you'll see that right here the fourth amendment so the rules are we want to know what you're searching for okay so but i want to go back to the first one the right of the people to be secure in their persons houses papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures now as i as i well let me give you the the example here i want you to that uh, your neighbor, your neighbor is up to some suspicious activity. You're not quite happy about it. You just have this gut feeling that something's not quite right. I mean, uh, there's parties that are going on. From what you can tell, there's a lot of, lot of drinking going on over the weekends. People getting drunk, people coming out front, you know, going home at one, two in the morning. And you know, they probably shouldn't be in that car some hooting and hollering along the way. And uh, you convey that to law enforcement. Law enforcement begins to do their own investigation. And uh, they come to the conclusion that they want to find out, man, are these guys dealing drugs? Or is there contraband going on, you know, they, that they got inside the home? And if there is, what kind of contraband? Are, are these guys maybe dealing with illegal weapons? Are they... Uh, dealing with drugs. And by the way, here's where we're not going. I don't want to have a conversation on the legality of the very substances. Okay. So if I'm talking about drugs, let's not get into that tonight. We've had that debate before. Governments should really keep their hands. I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on rules. What are the rules under these circumstances? Okay. So they suspect that this is going on. And what they do is they knock on the door and basically the residents tell them to get lost get lost. And so they don't allow law enforcement to come inside and law enforcement leaves. They then figure out when garbage day is. Garbage day happens every Thursday morning and most people put their garbage out on Wednesday night. So what does law enforcement do? They show up late Wednesday night and they search the garbage can. And in the garbage can, they find all kinds of things that are indicative of them dealing drugs inside the home, growing drugs, marijuana, and maybe some other indications that um, there's some things going on with weapons. Although not illegal, um, if you use a weapon in the course of committing a felony, I mean, if you're a drug dealer in many states, if you're a drug dealer and you're dealing drugs and you have a gun in your possession, they're, they're going to deal with you in some pretty severe ways because you're not just dealing drugs. You and we're concerned that you're using a weapon or they have access to a weapon during the course of committing that crime. So my question for you, they now have evidence that, that there's illegal acts going on. Is that search legal? Did they follow the rules of the fourth amendment or would you say, Hey, any evidence that they found is being tossed. So, what are your thoughts? Did they follow the rules here or not? Yes. Who said yes? Me. Wait, who is that? Was that? Lacey. Lacey. Lacey, good to have you on. So, Lacey, you say no, no problem with that. Because it's, um, well, it's the trash can. Is it the city's property? Okay. But um, that's a good point. Do you pay for that? Yeah, well, we pay okay. to use it. You pay to use it, right? So when you, so think about this. When I pay for a hotel, mm -hmm. I'm paying a hundred bucks a night. Can can law enforcement just come in to the to the hotel room? Mm, I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> no, they can't. They can't because. And here's the key word. If anybody's taking notes, here's the key phrase. Reasonable expectation of privacy. That's the key phrase around this Fourth Amendment issue. So as you're trying to think in your mind, hey, 
is the Fourth Amendment being followed? There's two questions you have to ask yourself. Number one, is the government involved? Because remember, there's no constitutional issue for the most part. There are some, there are a few exceptions, but by and large, the Constitution is only implicated if there's a government actor. In our scenario, we have a government actor. It's law enforcement. They show up and they're searching the garbage can. So because government is involved, they got to follow the rules. Well, what rules have to be followed? Well, in order to determine whether or not they have to follow the rules of the Fourth Amendment, the question is this. Do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy? Let me take some of you back. You guys remember we had a conversation about thermal imaging. Remember this it was about a month and a half ago. And we talked about law enforcement setting up a thermal imaging device out in the middle of your street, right? They have, they have a right to be on that street. They set it up and they're detecting basically heat emanating from your home to confirm a suspicion that they might be growing marijuana in, the, in somewhere in the home. We talked about that. And the entire question revolved around, do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in heat emanating from your home? So the same, same question goes here. As you're thinking about the garbage can, I want you to think first about what we were talking about with Lacey. When I pay for a hotel room, I don't own the hotel room. Ownership does not, well, ownership is not a primary issue when it comes to the Fourth Amendment. I can rent something. I can lease something. If you rent a home, you don't give up an expectation of privacy because you're not the owner. And when I lease or rent a hotel room, I don't give up an expectation of privacy in that hotel room. So even though the police might show up to the front desk of that hotel room and say, hey, can we search uh, room 126? And he said, oh, yeah, Shane Krauser's staying in that room, but go ahead. We're the owners. If they came into that room without a warrant, right, as a general rule, again, there's a few exceptions. But if they're just coming into that room without a warrant and they find something, that evidence will likely be suppressed. Why? Because the Fourth Amendment says that there are certain things you have to do. You've got to get that warrant before you come to that home, because I do have a reasonable expectation of privacy inside that hotel room, inside my home. The question here is, do I have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the things that I place into that garbage can and place out on the curb? I pay for that garbage can. I, I, you know, in Arizona, I'm, I'm in, in Gilbert. I think we pay uh, 15 to $20 a month, maybe a little bit more, I, something, or it's not too crazy. It's, it's somewhere between 15 and $30 a month is what we pay. Now we pay for the use of that garbage can and we pay for the weekly service to come pick up the garbage. So because I'm paying for it, I certainly have at least to a degree an expectation of privacy. The question is, is law enforcement infringing on that expectation of privacy when they come on that late Wednesday night and search the contents of my garbage can? What do you guys think? I think no, because you've put that garbage can out into the public domain. Oh, yeah. So anybody, anybody can open that garbage can and look at it. What if a dog tips it over? Is that illegal? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's not very nice and there might be garbage all over the place. But unless I put a lock on that can and have a service with a key that unlocks it and locks it back up, just like the hotel. I have a lock on that door. So I have an expectation yep. of privacy, plus I've paid for that room. So, so that room is mine during that time. But Jim, even if you don't place, thank you for your response, by the way. Well thought, well thought out, well said. Even if you don't lock your hotel room door, law enforcement can't just come in, right? The, the lock on the hotel room doesn't mean, hey, he didn't lock his room, therefore he had no reasonable expectation of privacy. I don't give I mean, my front door right now is open, right? It's unlocked. Law enforcement couldn't come in and say, well, Krauser, he dropped the ball. He uh, didn't lock his door. He gave up his expectation of privacy. Why do I have to do something with the garbage can to preserve that expectation? How, I guess what I'm asking, Jim, is how is it different? A garbage can 
where I'm disposing of my garbage on the expectation that it's going to the landfill. How is that different than um, me being in my home and preserving an expectation uh, simply by virtue of being inside of my home? Any thoughts on that? When you put it that way, yeah, that's that's interesting. I'm I'm still thinking you're putting that outside on the in the public domain, where my home is on my private property. I may be putting that trash can out on the road, which is city-owned property. Yeah, Jim, that, that, that's great. I, right. I think that's with a great Jim. Uh, only, yes. and I want to chime in here because I think, like, when people, you, I mean, everyone here has to know, like, when you when you put like something like maybe like a TV or. Uh, what am I thinking of? Like dressers or something. Like people will drive by and just like pick up the dresser and be like, oh, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. So it's like if you see that happening and you record it, then you get to go. You get to go tag these people for stealing your property. Then that, that that's. I feel like if we if we think one way, like if the cops can or cannot go into somebody's garbage, then then the same. I feel like we would have to hold the same logic to someone who goes to pick up, you know, some some cabinet or whatever that I put outside and they try to say, oh, you know, again, this, this cabinet looks nice. I could use this, throws it in the back of his truck, right? I see that as the same. So Brandon, um, that, I just want to clarify one, one issue. Thank you for your response. Number one, we're not, if this is not an issue of stealing or theft. So the, the question is whether or not law enforcement should be able to use this as evidence. So re let me just draw an analogy here. This fifth amendment. So let's say that your neighbor has murdered somebody and you just as a, a friend, you know, you're kind of naive as to what's going on. And you happen to be over at the house and the conversation evolves and evolves and evolves some more. And you're like, something's not right here. And you start to ask them questions and your neighbor confesses the murder to you. Can you use that confession? Yeah. You could go in and testify. Yep, this is what my neighbor said. I was over at his house. We have a casual conversation, and this is what he told me. Okay. But law enforcement, if law enforcement gets involved, right, that there are different rules that have to be followed. Let's say that that let, let me step back and kind of put a little twist on that scenario. Let's say that you know, you're pretty convinced that your neighbor killed, right? There's the the guy killed his wife. And you're like, I know this, something's not right. Like, you know, and, and you see some things and you're like, I'm going to go talk to him. The rules that you have to follow as a concerned citizen are not the same rules that the government has to follow, right? In our situation, in order for government who has probable cause to believe that he committed the crime, he can't just go over there and ask questions. He's got to read Miranda, right? There are certain rules now. We won't get into whether or not Miranda should actually be required by the Fifth Amendment. Right now, that's what the court said. So because the court says it, Fifth, Amendment's, Fifth Amendment is implicated here. So the difference is concerned citizen goes and talks to the neighbor, gets a confession, no problem. Law enforcement's going to get a confession upon having probable cause. They've got to read Miranda. The Fifth Amendment says there's certain rules. So with our garbage can, yeah, you might have somebody, you know, go and retrieve some garbage. But if you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that garbage can, law enforcement has to follow rules. And that rule in this case would be, I got to go get a warrant. Now, what about Jim's point? Jim is saying, well, actually, I want to go back and ask you a question, Jim. Do you agree that while that garbage can is on my property, right? It's on the side of my house and I put garbage in it throughout the week. Do I have an expectation of privacy while the garbage can is on my property? Yes. Okay. So your, your, your claim here is I lose that expectation of privacy. I'm giving up that expectation of privacy the moment that it's placed on the curb. Yeah, but then I'm also thinking now if I park my car on the street, then can they just break into my car because they think I have a joint in there? What are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Right? So maybe not. That, 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 that's, question. that's actually no, a, a, a good hmm. question. Right? Well, they can't I got search you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who is that? Kathy, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. And they can't search you on the street, your person, without probable cause. They can't just stop and search you randomly to see if by any chance you have something. Okay. So, Kathy, yeah. if I've got my car parked out on the curb, can 
let, let's leave out the joint issue for 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 the time being, Jim. Uh, so can law enforcement just go into your car that's parked out on on the main thoroughfare that goes through your neighborhood? No, but if you have something that's visible to them through the window, see that that gives them my there you know. go. That's why I said no. That we got to leave that because it kind of changes the scenario a little bit here. Yeah. Um, but uh, assuming that there's nothing visible, no contraband, can law enforcement just willy nilly search a person's car, even if uh, parked on a, a in a public area, right? That you know, it's, yeah, that's right. So what makes the garbage can then different? What makes the garbage can? Now, by, by the way, as you guys are thinking about this, I want you to know these. this is a very real scenario. This is a case that went up all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court where an individual was convicted of a crime based on evidence found in a garbage can, right? And so you can think about uh, law enforcement being pretty savvy about how they go about collecting evidence, right? And this is one way that we want to contemplate. What? What? Anybody else have thoughts on this? Do I have an expectation of privacy in that garbage can? Yeah, I'm going to change. I'm going to change my I'd answer yes. to say yes. Let's go, do. Well, this let's is go Jim, and then Joe. Jim, Joe, and I. I don't know if Dave was chiming in or not. Okay. Jim, take it away. I think, and I then think I'm going to change. I'm going to change my mind based on the car scenario. That my garbage, I should have an expectation of privacy. Okay. Even if it's um, out on the public domain, you know, in the in the street that's owned by the city. Okay, so your position you is your papers is and an things in it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It has your papers and your things. Mm -hmm. uh, your banana peel. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the fourth, the fourth Amendment, which says the right of the people. You have a right to be secure in your person. That's your body, in your houses, in your papers, and in your effects. Your effects is anything. I know this from being in a foreign country. When you put something in a box and send it through the postal system, you write personal effects. Your effects are your property, your items. And that trash can, because you rent it from somebody, is your effect. Okay? So unless there is a... And so you have a right not to be... Okay, that you're... Uh, against unreasonable searches and seizures. So what is a reasonable search? A reasonable search has to have evidence, has to have uh, you know, that, that a crime has been committed and that has to be presented. And in my mind, uh, to go into that, you have to have a warrant. You have to have some evidence presented before um, a, a legal tribunal and a decision has to be made to be able to go into your personal effects. So Joe, um, imagine you're walking down the street and a piece of paper falls out of your pocket and there happens to be a law enforcement officer in the area. Could that law enforcement officer pick that piece of paper up or does he need a warrant? Is it your paper? It's yours. No. You dropped it into the public area. Nope. It's your part. It's your paper. You so, have a right to be, you write, you have a right in your papers. Your papers don't have to be on your property. Your papers are your property. So your you dropped the piece of paper. You drop the piece of paper and your position is that government can't pick that up, that they have to cordon off the area and go and get a warrant um, signed off by a judge in order to access that piece of paper. That paper is yours. Mm -hmm. Now, paper, what if he was literal? That paper is your property. Is <laughs> the, I, Do you see something from that paper that uh, gives you a, uh, a reasonable suspicion that a crime has been committed without so picking you're, it up? You're, so, Joe, your position is that would be that would be an unreasonable search. If you if you pick it up, it's not yours. If you don't hand it right back to me, it's not yours. Uh huh. Um, what yeah, about I dropped, um, I dropped something. similar I dropped scenario? Something. You're you're walking down the street, Joe, and you're a smoker. And uh, I, I've got a as a law enforcement officer, I have a hunch that you've been involved in a murder and I want to figure out a way to collect your DNA. You're a smoker, you're walking down the street and you finish the cigarette and you flick it. And law enforcement says, I'm gonna grab that cigarette bud. And law enforcement goes over and pick that, pick that up. My but DNA is- Hold on, Joe. My DNA is my, DNA is my does, property. Hold on, Joe. Yo, let me finish the question. Do, does law enforcement have to go out and get a warrant 
for that cigarette bud? For my DNA to it, to that's not what I asked, Joe. Joe, do, do they have to get the warrant for the cigarette bud? But they can't test it for DNA. Okay, okay. So pick up the cigarette butt, but you can't test it for DNA. So they can pick up the cigarette. I've discarded it. Yes. I've discarded it. So it goes back to the trash can again. Once your trash gets to the dump. No, no, no. no. It didn't go into the trash can. It went onto the street. The same I'm saying it's the same thing. If your trash, they can't go into your trash can. Is is my opinion. What about if that trash makes it to the dump? Can they go through your trash when it's in the dump? That's kind of similar to the cigarette butt because I've actually discarded the cigarette butt, right? It's okay. in the dump, so, essentially. Sue, we're coming That's to you in just dump. a second. Let me, let, me, let me just finish one more thing. That piece of paper. So we're talking about cigarette butt on the one hand. You're saying you're discarding that. So law enforcement, if you discard it on the street, they would be able to access that. What about the piece of paper that... You, you take something out of your pocket, you wad it up, and you just throw it onto the ground. Can law enforcement pick that piece of paper up? Okay, did I discard it or did I accidentally drop it? In this case, you discarded it. Okay, if I discarded it, which was not the original situation, right. I, the original situation, I think it was stated that I dropped it, which in, in right. first accidentally. I, if I discarded it, um, that's a good question. I mean, is it, is it mine anymore? Once I've discarded it, I think that would be the question that you'd have to ask. Is it mine anymore or is it in the public domain? Well, the question, the question is, that revolves around the Fourth Amendment is, do I have a reasonable expectation? Uh, that's the question. So when I discard the cigarette butt, mm -hmm. uh, I think the reasonable answer is that I don't have an expectation of privacy. I'm giving it up. If I wanted to maintain and preserve my expectation of privacy, I would have never got rid of the cigarette butt. I, it's kind of the same thing that we it's talked about thing. a couple months ago that when right. I'm talking on the phone, I may want, I may wish to keep the conversation private, but if I'm yelling and screaming as I walk down the street and a law enforcement officer happens to be in a place that he's otherwise legally permitted to be, and he hears you yelling and screaming, man, you, you've given up an expectation of privacy. You haven't taken reasonable actions to preserve that expectation. So here, the cigarette butt, you're discarding it. It seems to me you're giving up. Um, you've at least given an indication that you are giving up that expectation of privacy. Sue, that's what were a, you going to say? That's, that's a reasonable assertion. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Well, first of all, you are a partial owner of the public domain. There is no such thing as public domain in which, which takes away your ownership. Agreed. Uh, unless you're a citizen of a, of, of a different country or a different state or something. Um, but if you're, if it's the city you live in and it's public domain, then you're a part owner of that. Okay. The second thing I wanted to say, yeah, if they can, and the question to me is if they can see it looking in your windows, then you don't have any expectation of um, privacy. So if you drop it on the street and pick it right back up, then you might have some expectation of privacy. But if you've dropped it on the street, even if it was an accident, you don't have an expectation of privacy. It's out there for people to see. But even if your garbage can is on the street, you're still a partial owner of that street. Mm -hmm. So Sue, what, is, what are your thoughts then? What's your ultimate conclusion? Um, I'm play uh, again, law enforcement does not have probable cause. They're simply looking uh, uh, for a way to access evidence and do it the easy way. And uh, it's here it is out on, a, on the street. Do they have to get a warrant or um, have you given up an yes. expectation of privacy? They have to get a warrant or else they have to wait until it's dumped into the dumpster. Now, once it's dumped into the truck and taken to the garbage, then it's in, then it's not yours anymore. But then they have to prove it was yours. They can't just right. prove it because it's in your garbage can. Right. They have to so, prove it um, was yours. So what, what, what's the magical thing that happens from going from the um, garbage can to the landfill or into the garbage truck? What, what magically happens? Where you I threw it away and you gave up your um, reasonable expectations. 
Well, why didn't I not give up that ex why did I not give up the expectation of privacy when I placed it out on the curb? What what what's magically happening? Because that's as still to the it's still you it's either your garbage can or it's one you rent. It's yours. Uh-huh. That's but what, still your property. But what is my expectation when I when I place garbage? Unless into the of garbage course your can, garbage can is oh, made out on, of glass. Sarah, let me let me finish. Let me finish. When I place the garbage into the garbage can and I place it out onto the street is not the reasonable expectation that I intend for a garbage truck to pick that up and haul it away. And thereby giving up my expectation of privacy. Yes, but they haven't yet. And it's still yours. And you could still run out at any time and grab it and bring it okay. back in. Okay. Well, oh, then awesome. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate that. Well, any other thoughts on this? Well, yeah. it, it does make me think that perhaps if instead of using a garbage can, if you put it in one of these disposable bags and you set the bag out on the mm. curb, it's no longer in your trash can. So now you mm. have a whole nother scenario where wow. perhaps you have totally surrendered your expectation of privacy. Wow, that is a great point. That's a great point because now at this point, I'm Nine, not placing one, it inside of a canister that I'm paying for or that I'm renting. I'm placing the garbage on the curb. And, and so- I bought that plastic bag. Well, say that again? I bought that plastic bag. Okay. Now, if it's clear plastic, but if it's not clear plastic, I bought that plastic bag. Okay. And so at, at what point, if, if at any point, at what point can law enforcement um, access that bag without a warrant. When when the trash man is picking it up, I, I think that there's been scenarios where the police actually go light on with the trash truck and the trash man picks up the trash and they just end up giving it to the cops. So what could happen? So Kathy, if I understand your position, like if you were if you were king and you're interpreting the way the Fourth Amendment should be implemented, your thing would be, hey, Law enforcement cannot go into that garbage can without a warrant, but they can wait for the garbage man to show up. They take the garbage, they put it into the garbage can, and law enforcement says, hey, hold on right there. And they, right after they've dumped it, before they drive away, hold on, and then they take the contents of the garbage can out, and that would be okay. Yeah. You're good with that, Kathy. I think that that's when they have fully surrendered their expectation of privacy. Okay. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? Is is everybody in agreement on, on that position? That that's when a person gives up their expectation is when that transition from the garbage can into the garbage truck in that transition. Is that is that the magical point of no return? Does it meet the test? That, well, that, that's the question. Does it meet the test of the language of the Fourth Amendment? I mean, you know, it says that you have a right you know, against unreasonable searches and seizures. What is an unreasonable search? Yeah. And, and it goes on to say, it goes, it goes on to say, no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause. So if there's not probable cause for a crime to have been committed, now you can't just go out and take everybody's DNA. That is, uh, that's unreasonable search and seizure. You're taking something that belongs to somebody. And when you go in and you gather DNA and you use it for these purposes, in my mind, like the cigarette, going back to the cigarette butt, um, if you don't have probable cause for picking up that cigarette butt, if you don't have probable cause for look, checking that DNA, then I, in my mind, you're going beyond the reasonable expectation of privacy. So, so number one, Joe, I think where we, if there isn't a, is a disagreement here, the disagreement is that the Fourth Amendment, um, whether or not the Fourth Amendment requires all searches to be accompanied by a warrant. That is not mm -hmm. what the Fourth Amendment says. There's two provisions. It yeah. says no unreasonable searches and seizures. Right. And then there's a warrants clause that says when there's those circumstances where a warrant is needed, it's got to be accompanied by proper probable cause. And then there's this issue of particularity. So at the same time, isn't a search should not whether you have a warrant or not, should not a search of a person's effects, house it, all this uh, all that entire list, shouldn't a search be accompanied by probable cause, whether whether it's a warrant is necessary or not. 
Right, right, right. No, you're no, no question about that. There's no question about it. But like the argument here is um, whether or not, because we're really looking at the first clause, is is it an unreasonable search in this case? Is Without it, probable so, cause, let, it is. let me share my screen with you guys and uh, show you. For those of you that don't have my book, I'm going to kind of give you a summary here of some things. Um, let's see here. So I, uh, this is kind of interesting. I want you to see an example of law enforcement and some of the things that they deal with, right? They're, they're looking at what the court, how the courts have interpreted the Fourth Amendment, and then they're putting this in to their policies. Can you all see that on your screen? It says search is not subject to Fourth Amendment protection. Yep. Yeah. Okay. This is actually from the Tucson Police Department. So down in Southern Arizona. And so I pulled this up. This is, this is the policy for their law enforcement agents. You know, it's, it's, it's issued out. And uh, when it says search is not subject to Fourth Amendment protection, what is meant by this are these are the types of searches that do not need to be accompanied by a warrant. In other words, these are the searches that are deemed to be reasonable searches where no warrant is required. So, you know, that, that, that's why I was asking a little bit earlier. Um, I was asking Joe about abandoned property, right? I've given up my, I, you know, I, 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 throw, I bought up a piece of paper and I toss it. Is that abandoned property? And that really is the issue that we're talking about here. I know it says garbage below. It says when a person places garbage by the curb, there's no longer any reasonable expectation of privacy. Now, why does Tucson PD say that? Well, because that's, I'm, I'm kind of ruining the story at this point. Court has said when garbage is placed out on the curb that there's you've given up your expectation of privacy, right? That's what we've been arguing about. Now, is the Supreme Court, you know, they, they get all these decisions right? Of course not. But that's what the current state of the law is today. And, and the reason why I bring this example up, um, like I do with most weeks, is because when you understand, right, because there's some disagreement on this call here, we might disagree in terms of what the Supreme Court said. But if you understand the scenario and the various issues surrounding the scenario, you'll, you'll have no issue um, addressing 95% of the issues that deal with expectation of privacy. We deal with the hard cases on this call because as you deal with the hard cases, most of the other cases are easy. And this is a hard case, right? Well, if I took a poll right now, there's no way that the, we, there'd be unanimous agreement on here because we all have different thoughts on, well, is there an expectation of privacy? We all agree on this call that there is an expectation of privacy in garbage being placed in a garbage can that, that is mine or that I'm renting. Where the disagreement is here is when do I relinquish that expectation of privacy? Because when I relinquish the expectation of privacy, there's no longer a require for a warrant, right? According to what you're seeing on your screen. Once I've abandoned property, I don't need to go get a warrant. That's an exception to the warrant requirement, right? And, and again, with this case, with garbage, what the court has said is, hey, once you've placed garbage onto a curb, you've given up an expectation of privacy. Guess what that means? No warrant is required, right? And so down here in plain view, Plain view, there's no expectation of privacy in object in plain view, and so no search is performed. What that means is there's no need to go get a warrant. Now, what is an item in plain view? So you pull somebody over, and uh, uh, law enforcement pulls somebody over, and what do they see in the back of the car, in the back seat? A dead body, contraband, you, you name it. Something illegal is going on back there or at least there's probable cause to believe something is illegal going on back there. And that sort of scenario with the car, that's what they're talking about in plain view. The, and, and I think Sue hit on that a little bit earlier. It, in this case, it's in plain view. Do I need to go get a warrant with regard to the specific thing that I've identified? It's not free access to do whatever it is that you want to do. It's free access to do what? To go in and access the information and either confirm or dispel the suspicion that you had based on the on the thing that you saw in plain sight. 
So this is just, you know, think about the dog sniff, right? The um, law enforcement officers will do this quite often, right? That especially the, the patrol officers that have dogs with them. They'll approach somebody. Hey, can I search your car? Nothing in there, right? Nope, nothing in there. They pull the dog out and the dog does a run around the car and gives off a signal that there's contraband in the car. What the courts have said is based on that, there is now probable cause and no need to go out and get a warrant. What, so here's what I would encourage you to do. For those of you um, that have my book, to really understand this, page 97 gives the exceptions to the warrant requirement. If, there is, if, if the scenario that you're looking at does not fall into one of those eight exceptions, here's, what you can, here's, here's the guarantee. You must have a warrant to conduct that search. If it doesn't fit into one of those exceptions, some of which are outlined right here on your screen, you must have a warrant. So kind of going back to our original scenario, if there is an expectation of privacy in the garbage, in that garbage can, there must be a warrant. Do you see, do you see how they, uh, the Tucson Police Department, they actually do a pretty good job. But I want you to notice a phrase that you see over and over and over again. Look at this. Um, when a person places garbage by the curb, there is no longer any reasonable expectation of privacy. That's the key word for analyzing that Fourth Amendment. Let's go down uh, here. Open fields. Reasonable expectation of privacy. Personal characteristics. Reasonable expectation of privacy. Plain view. No reasonable expectation of privacy. Why? That's the key word. So as you go about analyzing, you, you know, you hear something on the news. You hear about the Trump deal. Whatever that might be, the, you should ask yourself two questions. Number one, is there a government actor? If the answer is yes, okay, now we are debating the Constitution. In this case, we're debating the Fourth Amendment. Okay, now that we're debating the Fourth Amendment, I have to answer the question, is there an expectation of privacy? If the answer is there is no expectation of privacy, there is no need for a warrant. If there is an expectation of privacy, you better have a warrant. So you can kind of, if you really want to get good at this, folks, I, what I would do is after we're done with the call, just put together a kind of a, you know, answer question number one, government actor. Okay, go down to the next one. Is there an expectation of privacy? Yes, expectation of privacy. What's the answer? I need a warrant. No, there's no expectation of privacy. Law enforcement can search. Now, I, I'm, I'm being a little bit elementary in, in that analysis because there can be some things get hot and heavy in that. But 98, 99% of the issues that you analyze that come to searches and seizures those are going to be the questions. Now, here's what we're going to do next week. We uh, hit on search this week. Next week, we're going to hit on seizure. A little bit different scenario, and we're going to have a lot of fun with that. And, of course, there'll be some overlap on this issue. Let me say this in closing. Do I, um, for purposes of the garbage can, you now know what the court said, that once you put it on the curb, there is no expectation of privacy. Did the court get it right? We get to decide that, right? We can argue about those things. The courts make decisions all the time and then later they reverse those decisions, okay? So just because a court said it, it's not necessarily the end all be all. We can still have a debate as a culture and a society as to whether or not they got that right. So that's really important. That just because a court says A, B, and C doesn't necessarily mean that they went about interpreting the constitution in a way that is consistent with original intent. We can still have the conversation, we can still have the argument. So guys, I, I hope this was helpful because um, I think so often when we start debating the constitution, we like to just talk principles. Like we're very comfortable talking principles. And what you're seeing us do here is talking about real world scenarios. Like if we're gonna be defenders of the constitution, we can't just be guys and gals that are very good at articulating the principle. We've got to get good at articulating what the rule book requires. And that was the goal here tonight as we hit on that. So 
Guys, I'm excited about where we're going. I love meeting with you all every week, uh, every Wednesday night and talking about where we're headed and just bringing the platoons together, if you will, to talk about here's the ideal, here's the foundation, here's how we execute together. So Kathy, thanks so much for having me. It was an absolute pleasure. I actually see a few hands up as we close out. Don, Don Dickinson, did you have something? If you would uh, just announce, somebody asked about the title of your books. If you would just announce that uh, so people can go buy them. Yeah, yeah. So I've written two books. One is Your Nation to Save. And uh, that's the line-by-line -line explanation of the Constitution. And the other book is called What is Freedom? Is it for you? And it's the subtitle is 25 Ideas That Will Change the Way You See America. It's, it's, it's an in-depth analysis on... Uh, fundamental principles, what it means to be free, how you go about defending the liberties of others, going through and the Constitution itself, American exceptionalism, all of those things. It's, you know, how do we go about defending? You can find those on either uh, uh, eBay or on, uh, on Amazon. By the way, you will see some books, both of those books listed, and they're pretty pricey. Uh, there are some people that are listing those books for over a $100. In fact, uh, this book right here, Your Nation to Save, somebody sold a, a signed copy of it when I was working with Glenn Beck, sold it for $3,200. And I didn't get a commission. Freaking heck, what's up with that? But um, anyways, do not spend um, $50, $60, $70. I know on Amazon, there's a couple going for that price. I guess it's the marketplace, right? That, that I'm not selling it for those. You can get it for uh, you know $12 to $15 on eBay or on Amazon. So anyways... Back to you, Kathy. Thank you. Kathy, you're on mute still. I do that. Okay. I apologize. When we first started, there wasn't anybody new on the call, so I didn't take a minute like I like to and introduce Shane and tell you about his book. Um, but um, I'll just show it to you really quick right now. Your Nation to Save. Um, I did get this one at eBay, and I think it was like $14, and I got it super quick. And this, I, I kind of consider, I don't want to sound sacrilegious saying this, but I consider this my Bible of the Constitution because the format is super easy. You don't have to have 188 IQ to understand it. It has the words of the amendment, the wording of the Constitution, then it gives a historical context how it's been interpreted, how it applies today and everything, and have a little area in there for notes. So real often I'm writing notes in those chapters. So yeah, that is an awesome one. And the second one here is what is freedom and is it for you? And both of those I got off of eBay and they came super quick. And I, I think every home in America should have them there, you know, especially if you're in that age where you're raising kids and stuff still. You know, why wait until they're 50 or 60 and then struggle to learn about freedom? Why not be raised with it their whole life, you know? So I, I like having that. So, so I want to thank everybody for coming. I see some people, Kelted and Kelvin. I'm excited to see you tonight. I haven't seen you in a while, so I'm glad you're here. And our new faces are here, too. I want to welcome you and everybody back. And next week, we will be back. Um. I will be sending another uh, text message out with people's rights. We're going to be having a, a meeting for assistance on Sunday um, and doing some potluck activities really quick. So we'll be looking, checking in your text messages for that. Um, would anybody like to volunteer to close us out with prayer? Okay, then I will go ahead and do that. Our Father, chart in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the constitution that thou hast given us. We're grateful that we live in a time in history when there is more freedom on the earth than there has been. Um, but we know it is also a troubled time and a perilous time for us. And we ask you to help us to be vigilant, to be aware, to understand and see and know and wade through the commotion that is around us um, so that we might be protectors of liberty. We're thankful that our technology worked tonight and ask you to bless us that it will continue to work, that we'll be able to um, shed some light to other people around us who don't understand the value of the Constitution, that as we learn, that we might be able to share these wonderful principles. And this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for being with us, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Have a good night. It's a great meeting. Good night, everyone. Good night.
Sinan.